Who doesn't love a free lunch? Well, I definitely do. But um, this paper proposes, uh, proposes a method to get some free lunch out of a unit. So I'm a big fan of that. But yeah, uh, anyway, this, uh, this model called, um, or this um, improvement called Free You um, basically finds this, quote, free lunch. So basically a like, something you can get uh, with minimal effort uh, in the unit for uh, diffusion. And uh, it's, a interest, it's a very simple idea. And it's very, it looks to be effective. Uh, it would be interesting to see how it actually works uh, in implementation. But uh, the main problem, like one of the big problems with diffusion are these artifacts where, and uh, this, this right uh, example here, you can see it has like two sets of teeth and it's very weird. Um, this, is a, this is one of the big problems with diffusion. It has these artifacts where you like specify something this is probably, uh, maybe the description was a picture of a kid laughing. I mean, this bottom one is clearly that. This top one is kind of that, but not really. Um, yeah. And then you have other ones, but uh, I feel like this right one shows off exactly what the problem is that they're trying to solve. And it's basically getting it to um, have the right, uh, the right features you're looking for. And free you base uh, does this uh, pretty easily. Um, yeah, so now instead of having this creepy picture up here with two sets of teeth, you can have equally creepy pictures following the prompt you asked for. I, there, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, first, diffusion, like, like usual. Um, what is it? So you have an image. Uh, I will make this 2.2. So you have an image, uh, we'll make this a cat, like usual. Oh, that is terrible. Uh, there, it's always terrible. But here's your picture of a cat. So what we can do to this picture is we can add a little bit of noise. So to transition from this image to this image, you would add a little bit of noise. I'll show that by the red dots, and the noise, we'll call this Z, is sampled from a Gaussian between, um, it's a Gaussian with zero mean and uh, sigma variance, um, sigma i because it's a univariate, but sigma variance, and uh, the sigma will increase over time. So at this point here, sigma is very low, meaning we had a little bit of noise, and this would be, say, t is equal to 0, t is equal to 1. And as you increase uh, t, the amount of noise in your image um, increases. So at this point here, you add a little bit more noise. And um, yeah, the noise you add is just sampled from, uh, like a, it's just sampled from a Gaussian and you add it. But um, there's a little trick I'll show in a sec so that you don't actually have to um, uh, there's a little trick to speed up this process, so you don't have to do t steps to get anywhere in the in the diffusion chain. So this is t is equal to two. T is equal to two, and it has a little bit more noise than t is equal to one. So a little bit more noisy, and you do this say big t times t is equal to big t. Maybe that's a thousand, and you get to an image that is pure Gaussian noise. So this is just pure Gaussian noise. You don't have your cat in there anymore, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I forgot my triple dots. So you have this chain that's basically a thousand images long, and it's just a sequence of continuous noise addition. And let's say our image is x. Then x at time t is equal to our original image x, um, times some alpha plus our noise, say uh, uh, this would be, we'll make that uh, normal, normal distribution, one minus alpha t times this, this noise here, this, this noise. So anywhere in the process is an interpolation between a Gaussian sample, so sample from a Gaussian distribution, or an image, uh, your original image. 
And uh, this right here, alpha, uh, it's between 0 and 1. Um, so whenever, let's say that uh, this is 0, then you have no original image and you have all noise. And whenever this is 1, you have all image and no noise. So this would be uh, alpha t is equal to 0. And this would be alpha t is equal to 1. And that's how you can go anywhere in between the chain at any time step. So that's to, that's um, how you can create your images. And then to go reverse this process so that you can reconstruct the cat, you train a model. Uh, we'll call this epsilon theta. So you train a model to basically reverse this one step at a time. So uh, epsilon theta will take in the image here and produce this image here. Now, Epsilon theta, our model, is not going to predict the image because that is a difficult task. Taking this image and predicting this image is a lot more difficult than taking this image and just predicting the red dots, the noise in the image. So epsilon theta actually predicts the noise in the image. And it doesn't just predict the noise in the image at any time step. It actually predicts all the noise in the image. So let's say at this time step, it would just be a it would just be an identity function because it would predict the same exact quote image. And that allows you to, since it can predict all the noise, you can uh, kind of move it one step at a time after it predicts all the noise. So it predicts all the noise in this image, and maybe it's probably going to have some errors in there, but you can move it along the diffusion chain just one step after it predicts all the noise. So uh, there's some tricks you can use by uh, the some o some ODE uh, solvers you can use to um, if you have uh, if you have it in this uh, in this form, and uh, it's a lot easier to deal with if whenever it predicts all the noise. But that's just how you model it. Um, not important for this discussion right now, but that's how you model it, where it just predicts all the noise in the image, and you move, you, you take like a, a sample, you take like a part of that noise to kind of move it a little bit backwards, as opposed to all the way backwards to the original image. So that's what you're doing. Epsilon theta, just predicting the noise. Now, what is epsilon theta? Epsilon theta, our model, is a unit, and I'm going to go here because they have some really good images of the unit. And everyone knows units. We all love units. So this unit here will take in our noisy image of the cat. So it would look like this. And it would output the, the noise in this image. So if I paste that over here, I can get rid of the cat. And that's what the model is learning to do. It's kind of learning to remove the, like, uh, the actual image part of the image to give you the noise output. And then from here, you can remove a part of this from this image and repeat the process. And that's just that's the diffusion process. Uh, you can also see it up here. This is the initial time step, all noise. Uh, you throw it through your unit, and the unit will output the it slowly over time. It'll denoise the image because it predicts the noise, and you can remove the noise. Now, this is actually in latent diffusion. Um, if you, it is an actually pixel diffusion. And if you're curious how latent diffusion works, um, check out stable diffusion. Stable diffusion is how th th that's how uh, images are actually created. It's not in. It's not using the pixel values. It's using the latent, uh, the latent space. So that's actually what they're using. And that's why this initial image is not, it's like noisy. It's not Gaussian noise though. So that's, that's what um, we're looking at. We're looking at this unit. And what they do is they look at the parts of the unit. Um, they kind of break it down. So you have this initial encoder part, uh, this part here, this is your encoder. And your encoder just kind of down samples the images, but you save the skip connections here. Now, the decoder, or the the, the kind of decoder part of this this unit, the upscaling part. This is the downscaling part. 
and this is kind of the upscaling decoder part, will take the uh, take the down sampled features and upscale them. But as it's upscaling them, it concatenates the the uh, the the progressive downscaled images. So this skip there's a skip connection here, and you do a concatenation of the features. Um, so you have this these features here, which is the output of this layer, and you concatenate it with the upscaled features here. So there's two parts. There's the skip features, which they call, um, this will basically be S, and we have the backbone features, which are the, the upscaling features from the, um, the downsampled image, which are, um, I guess, B in this case. And you can see that every part of the um, upscaling has this uh, these two features in it. The skip features from the original input image um, that's being downsampled, and the backbone features from the, the upscaling part. So you have these two features, and this is very important uh, for what they look at. So when they look at this, they see um, that the uh, these features basically encode two different uh, sets of information. So the backbone features, they say, encode high frequency information. Uh, if we look here, the backbone here, this is the frequency information. So it encodes high frequency, uh, um, sorry, no, the, the skip connections encode the high frequency information. Uh, as you can see here, it encodes some high frequency information as well as low frequency information. Um, but the backbone encodes mostly lower frequency information. Uh, you can see that it definitely has a negative trend and the frequency information uh, gets, gets the lower, um, like it has a lot more lower frequency information. And as the, the frequency increases, the, it's, it's not as prevalent in the image. Now, what the heck does this even mean, the frequency information? Um, if we look up here, we have this image of a squirrel. Uh, this looks to be an image inter in some intermediate stage. Maybe this is t is equal to like 500 um, if we're on the 1,000 scale. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, you can see that the low frequency information basically encodes the entire image, while the high frequency information it doesn't look like it has very much here, but uh, you can kind of see a squirrel here. And if you go from this image to the image to your left, then you can kind of see a squirrel in there. But the image is mostly composed of this low frequency information. Like this is the visual, vi visual information that you are looking for. You don't care about this as much. Whenever you're looking at it, you care more about the, the actual image part. And the low frequency information is, composes that information. And you can see as you increase the time steps, the low frequency information basically is the image. The high frequency information are like details in the image. Um, if we just had this, you would be, you know that this is a squirrel. And if we just had, had this, it's a, like, you know it's a squirrel, but it doesn't have all the nice features you're looking for. This itself is just a is basically just a blurry image. This here is some some weird looking thing. And uh, yeah, this is this is um, what they this is what they find in the unit that this information here is encoded by the backbone B, and this information here is encoded by the skip connection S. And that makes sense if we go over to the unit. If we take this layer here, it's basically going to be the the cat. So the skip connection will encode all the features of this of this cat, and you you would imagine that it would need this in for this the high frequency information for for kind of the details in there. Um, so it kind of it kind of makes sense why the skip connections encode the high frequency information, and the backbone features encode the low frequency information. Now. They say that they they make an argument that the backbone features are actually what you need, and the skip features you don't really need those 
as much. And they can kind of affect the, the denoising process. If we look here, they say, so that's their, their conjecture. And they say our conjecture grounded in this observation. Uh, so during training of the unit architecture, the presence of high frequency features may expedite the convergence toward noise prediction within the decoder module. So the high frequency features affect the noise prediction that the model makes in a bad way. Furthermore, the limited impact of the, modulation, the modulating skip features in figure five uh, also indicates that the skip features predominantly contribute to the decoder's information. Um, yeah, so that's the problem that they want to fix, and they basically claim that you want less of the skip feature information. Now, let's say we have a way to decrease the skip feature information according to S. So S is going to be um, some scale factor that we have. Let's say that is, uh, S is equal to one, means that we have 100% skip. So S is equal to one is basically a normal unit. You have your, your skip connection features uh, like normal. And B is equal to one is the same. You have your skip connection features like normal, or you, you have your backbone features like normal, and B is basically your scale factory for your backbone. Now, if we look at this image here, if let's say we decrease B, decreasing B gives you this image here, and you can tell that it's like not, it's not what you're looking for. You want this image here. And this is because the backbone is encoding a lot of this low level information. Um, and if we look, if we look up here, like the low inf level information is what's actually encoding the, the image itself. It's what it, it is the image basically, while the high level features are just the details in that image. So decreasing B basically is kind of changing the image in a, in a bad way. You're going to have a lot less of these low level features and you're going to have a lot more of these like fine grain details kind of making the image look a little bit sharper. Um, and increasing B on the other hand will give you an image more re representative of what you were looking for. Um, this image here, I guess is to the extreme, but doing it a little bit kind of makes the image um, a little bit, a little bit better, I would say. Uh, they say down here, increasing the backbone scaling factor B significantly enhances the image quality. So yeah, this image quality here, well, this image quality here, it's, it gets better as you increase B. Uh, while variations in the skip connection uh, scaling factor S have uh, like little influence on the image synthesis quality. So if we change S here, if you change it uh, by decreasing it, uh, like it doesn't do very much if you look at it. It doesn't doesn't do very much. And increasing it also doesn't do very much either. Uh, however, I would argue that there's a, like a, if you look at these images, this image here has a little bit less fine grain detail than this image here. And it's hard to tell on this PDF, but I think that's what S is also doing. It's kind of a, it kind of has this fine grain detail that it is um, it's adding. Well, B is basically the the high the the high level uh, image itself. So, uh, and this is a balance here that that you're going to have to make. And uh, to do these, so they introduce these scaling factors B and S. And um, basically, increasing B gives you more of the image you were kind of looking for. Uh, it, it basically increases the quality of the image, uh, so you don't get the artifacts like we had up here, uh, this artifact here. While increasing S basically um, has more fine grain detail in it. And uh, to do that, there's two parts. So you need, to, you need to have a B area, you need to have a, a B scale and an S scale. And they introduce this B scale here. So at some layer, uh, you have these intermediate outputs. And the intermediate outputs, X, are from the backbone. And uh, the backbone features are scaled by B. And you only do that for half the channels. So 
that's all you're doing. You're just scaling by B. And B can be some value, uh, 1, 1.4. Uh, so that's how you scale B. S, on the other hand, um, you scale by taking the Fourier transform. So the first step is take the Fourier transform of the um, of the of H, and H is your your skip connection at layer L, and then you multiply. So you kind of mask H. So if we um, let me get this over here. So whenever you do the Fourier transform, you basically have uh, your you're going to have the frequency. And they call it radius here, but uh, it's basically like amplitude or prevalence on your x-axis. And let's say we have a lot of um, low frequency information. Maybe maybe you have something that looks like this. So you have a lot less high frequency information. Then your mask maybe scales a part. Of, maybe it scales this so that um, maybe it scales a part of this so that. Uh, the information will maybe maybe we remove the high level information so then you just remove it um yeah so that's that's all that masking would do and then whenever you transform this back it wouldn't have the the high frequency information so uh yeah you first do the fourier transform and then you mask it so you mask it using this alpha and then you take the inverse Fourier transform and get your new representations of um, of H. So they say here that obviously that is element-wise multiplication, and that is the mask designed as a function of the magnitude of the Fourier coefficients, serving to implement the frequency depending dependent scaling factor S. So yeah, you you have S sub L, and that's a mask. Uh, S sub L is the uh, the scale. Uh, for the skip connections, uh, yeah. So that's how you scale it. You just scale. You just scale the free. You just scale the um, the frequencies. Uh, they say here with a high enough radius. So I think that's just prevalent enough information. So if it's high enough, then you scale it. But if it's slow, then you don't scale it, and you scale it by s, where s is just some value, maybe it's equal to 1, maybe it's equal to 0 0.6, something like that. Some scale value. And you may want to make this lower, you may want to make this higher. Um, they make it higher, uh, I think. I think they make it higher because um, you both want a little bit more. Oh, no, I think they keep that, they keep that constant because this is kind of... Um, an image like this is what you're looking for. So if you just keep that constant, or maybe you decrease it a little bit, then you can get the image you're looking for. But these are parameters you would want to play around with. And B would increase your low frequency information, and S basically increases your high frequency information. And that's the idea. Um, yeah, and they say how they implement it for stable diffusion and stuff. Um, and then they give a bunch of examples. Uh, yeah, but this is an interesting hyperparameter to play around with. Um, I don't. I wouldn't actually call it a free lunch. I would actually call it a trade-off. Um, if we go back up to the top, you can see this picture here. It kind of has a little bit more detail uh, on the face, while this one here it definitely follows the prompt you're looking for. However, uh, it doesn't have as like it's very it has a smoothing effect because you don't have as much high frequency information. So it has a smoothing effect where the image is kind of not as not as crisp. There's not as many high level free features in there. Um, you can see that kind of here in the background. It has a smoothing effect. The de there's not as many details in there, and definitely this picture here also has a smoothing effect. Um, and that's the pro that's one of the problems with this method. Is it has a smoothing effect. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just look at uh, some of the examples. Uh, this one down here, I thought was pretty good. Uh, you have this left part here, which is something riding a motorcycle, but this is definitely a cat riding a motorcycle. Um, 
They also have other images like um, like this teddy bear walking in a snowstorm. I guess this looks more like a bear, but this is definitely a teddy bear. A uh, boy is playing Pokemon. This It has some artifacts here, but um, for you doesn't have those artifacts. It actually has the, the object. Um, yeah, let's look at some more. Uh, I think this is the the image or the the video, and I, lo I love the Shutterstock uh, artifact that's that's in all these. But yeah, you have this. Uh, I mean, it looks fine. Looks like what you asked for. Um, yeah, this is it. The astronaut one. You can see that it has the astronaut there, but it's not very good. But with um, Free, it actually has the the astronaut there. Like it's an actual astronaut. Um, yeah, and the, the smoothing effects are very minimal in these cases. Uh, yeah, and then they have a, a few more examples like this one. Have an artifact here, but it looks good um, here. Uh, same with Mario, with the original part. The uh, the original Staple Diffusion, it looks not as good as with a Free U. Um, yeah. I think that uh, it would be interesting to look at. So they, they have a constant scale, basically. They have a constant S scale and a constant uh, B scale. So basically, you have a constant um, throughout your denoising process. B and S stay the same. I think it would be interesting to... So if I, if I go uh, here, I think it would be interesting to change B and S through your diffusing process. Whenever you are low in the diffusing stages, such as here, the diffusing kind of creates the base image first. It kind of diffuses out, in this case, it would diffuse out kind of like the global teddy bear structure. So I think once you get here, you have, say, a high B value. And then whenever you get to like a good point in the diffusing process, you then change to maybe a higher, a higher uh, S. So once you have your structure of your, of your image, then you change to a higher S so that you can create these fine grain details. Like this image here, it's hard to change this image in such a way where it would have um, defor deformations, but uh, increasing S if you have a higher S, perhaps you can get some re a really crisp output image with uh, very fine grain details in it. And I think that may mitigate the, the smoothing process. Um, just an idea I had whenever I was reading this paper, and I think it, it, it's, it'll be interesting to explore. Um, but yeah, uh, that's the paper. It's just adding S and B, uh, and those uh, trades off your low-level and high-level features, and just having a higher B tends to give you a better looking image representative of what you actually wanted because uh, like it doesn't have these artifact issues. So it's interesting that this does kind of fix the artifact problem, but it gives you a smoothing effect. And I think kind of changing B dynamically, changing BNS dynamically could uh, maybe uh, give you best of both worlds. So not as much as a free lunch as a trade-off, but um, yeah, it's still an interesting paper nonetheless. Not not many papers kind of look at the the unit model, and I thought I thought it would be interesting to kind of look at that.